Hello everyone and welcome to um, our our webinar or oh, two seconds. Um, every, uh, Gordon, you just might have to mute mute your phone or mute yourself. Perfect. Um, hi everyone, uh, welcome to our webinar on maximising your sheep reproduction in 2020 and 2021. Um, my name's Kate McCarthy and I'm with the Northwest Local Land Services as a Livestock Officer. And tonight um, our main presenter is going to be Dr. Gordon Refshorgi from New South Wales DPI. And we also have Brett Smith from Elders, who I'll give an introduction to both um, in a minute. But they'll, um, Brett will be on to, we had a webinar previously that was a bit more focused towards the market in the, the sheep industry. Um, so Brett's sort of, uh, we've, we're working together on this, so he'll be there to answer any questions um, towards the end of the presentation. If you have any market related questions or any follow up webinar questions, if you were on the previous one before. Um, so that's my contact details for reference there. Um, next slide. So um, as I said before, I'm a livestock officer with local land services and yeah, we, we sort of made it one of our priorities to make sure that we're continuing to engage with producers in the region. And to do so, that's, you know, required different forms of engagement as what we're used to with face-to-face -face events. So we've really taken on board the webinars and we've found them to be a really great success. And, um, you know, uh, as producers, people are, are finding we're getting a lot of engagement for that. So it's been excellent. So a little bit of what, what we do as LLS is we're sort of here to yeah, support producers with um, information and resources to help you improve your agricultural productivity. Um, we also have biosecurity teams that help work with um, you know, your pest animals. And we've got veterinarians that help work with animal disease. And essentially, yeah, we're here to help you to manage and improve as well natural resources. So within LLS, we have various um, groups of employees or technical staff and that includes people in the NRM services, ourselves in the ag team, veterinarian, so your district veterinarian and also your biosecurity team. And yeah, one of the things we've, as I said before, is we're still working hard to make sure that we continue to provide information and um, resources to you as producers and, and listeners. So um, one, I guess some things for the webinar. Um, we're going to obviously Brett will be uh, sorry, uh, Gordon will be giving his presentation. But um, as listeners, you'll you're automatically put on mute. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, there's a bar that comes up with the go to webinar on the side of your screen. Hopefully you have access to that, and it gives you the option to ask questions, which you would type um, on your uh, computer. Those questions will come up on my screen and, and I'll aim to ask them to Gordon and Brett um, towards the end of the webinar. So if you could just, um, I suppose I'd probably, uh, I, I'll ask the question, but if it's more targeted towards one or the other, maybe just put that down. Um, I'll, uh, like I said, I'll collate that and yeah, Brett's definitely available as well to answer any questions. One thing that's really important, and I would appreciate if you took the time, we have a, um, a survey that will come to you straight after the webinar. If you are able to fill out that survey, um, I know it takes, you know, it's, it's not always the most enjoyable thing, but it's not too time consuming and it really helps us with these sort of things. It helps guide what we do next and what, what I suppose what you're wanting to learn about and find information on. So. Um, that's that and then as always there'll be a recording available of, of this webinar. So um, some polling questions that gives us a bit of an idea on um, on what's, what's happening um, and what you're interested in and, and sort of where you're listening in from. So my first poll is, um, I'll put it up on the screen, if you're able to um, just pop in an answer to that. So what is your involvement in the sheep industry? If you would um, just pop that down. Just got almost half voted. Five, four, three, two, one. 
I'll close that one. So we've got mostly sheep reducers on board, um, a few people that have put themselves down in other and some um, non-government advisors. So that's interesting. Um, I'll open the next one. So launch. It's always interesting to know where you guys are listening in from. So if you want to pop that down. Half the audience have voted. In five, four, three, two, one. I'll share that one. So we've got a, a mix. We've got some people outside of New South Wales, some just in New South Wales and other regions, and a few Northwest listeners. So that's good. Um, we'll get the next one, just a couple more. So just to help, I guess, help guide the presentation, this is always interesting. Are you currently using scanning um, as a tool within your sheep enterprise? So probably targeted towards more the producers. We've got half voted, five, four, three, two, one. I'll close that and share. So that's interesting. We've got 64% of listeners are using scanning as a tool and 36% and of listeners aren't. So that um, is always helpful to know. Um, just a couple more. So launch. For those that have scanned, that 64% of listeners that have scanned, have you scanned for multiples? And five, four, three, two, one. That's, yeah, okay. Half said, almost half said yes and, and half said no. So it'd be interesting to see the reasoning behind that. Um, and uh, this is one that will sort of help, yeah, help um, guide the, you know, for feed base with our with our winter cereals popping up a little bit more, especially with Northwest producers. Um, yeah, interesting to see if if you guys are using um, for, forage as your feed base. So half voted now. So five, four, three. Two, one, close. Yeah, okay. Yep. So, sorry, I'll help if I can share that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, 60, what is that? 60% said yes and 40% and said no. So, um, yep, that's interesting for Gordon. So, I'll hide that. Um, go back to my screen. Um, so, I'll now, oops spend some time introducing Gordon. So Dr. Gordon um, Rafshorgi is a, is a research scientist working in the field of small ruminant production. He's worked on studies involving genetics, meat science, meat goat reproduction, nutrition, wool production, some disease work, some vaccination and body temperature studies which has led to strong interest in the thermal environment impact on sheep production. Gordon's known in places as the autopsy guy, as he's done a lot of work on neonatal lamb autopsy. And he's recently led a project that developed a prototype to measure body condition score in sheep. Gordon's currently involved in several research projects, which include mineral balance in sheep, grazing perennial wheat, the survival of triplet ewes and their lambs, increasing the adoption of pregnancy scanning, which is interesting based on um, just those polls that we've had, the vulnerability of sheep production systems to climate variability, and the refinement of body condition score targets for spring and summer mating. And um, yeah, especially for someone that is like, like myself is really interested in the sheep um, industry and, and work works amongst it, I really value the work that Gordon does and that's why I was so keen to get him on and um, do this presentation because he definitely does a lot of very interesting stuff in the sheep industry. So hopefully you'll be able to pick up some of those insights from this webinar. And yeah, he's had a really positive in, uh, influence on the industry doing a lot of work across the country. So 
Um, that's Gordon. I'll also just do a little um, let you know about Brett. So for those that weren't um, listening in on our other webinar, Brett and I have worked together on this sort of um, webinar series, I guess. And yeah, Brett works for Elders as a district wool manager. And he covers the um, northern and southern end, um, so north and west New South Wales and southern Queensland. Brett's um, grown up on a merino sheep uh, property um, in, uh, in New South Wales. And he now bases himself in Tamworth, but still covers the Walgut area um, and Canamble as well as into Queensland. So he's worked for elders for five years and worked on programs such as Lifetime New Management and Pasture for Profit. Um, his, his area of focus is in um, wool marketing uh, and yeah, this has allowed Brett to work with a lot of clients in his time and has gained a few awards such as the National Wool Broker of the Year. So um, that's uh, Gordon and Brett. Um, I'll now hand over to um, Gordon to give his presentation. So um, I'll share the screen. Yeah. And I'll hand over to you, Gordon. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, it's a lovely introduction, and thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to connect with your part of New South Wales and Southern Queensland. Uh, I'd like to just start by reassuring everybody that you're all completely normal. Um, the survey questions you've just answered on uh, your adoption of pregnancy scanning, whether you scan or not, whether you use twins uh, in your scanning adoption, uh, aligns completely well with the rest of the industry, <clears throat> where around about 50% of Australian sheep producers are pregnancy scanning. Uh, and around about 30% are scanning for twins. Uh, and so we have a higher proportion of scanning in, in, this, in this audience, uh, but about the same number scanning for twins as the national data would suggest. Hey so, Gordon, it says Kate. Um, we can just see your, like your notes screen. You might have to put your other presentation, move the screen for your presentation. Oh, okay. I don't worry about that. That's fine. Everybody can follow okay. it as it goes. I don't mind. <clears throat> okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Uh, okay, right. So I've, what I've got is a presentation where we want to talk about how you're going to manage your animals at the moment for the conditions that are in front of you, but then thinking about how you're going to improve uh, reproduction in your flocks to rebuild your flocks and help the industry re rebuild the national flock after we've come out of three or four years of intense drought. And I'm mindful, of course, that there are still plenty of people in drought in New South Wales and in Queensland and northern New South Wales, western New South Wales and southern New South Wales in particular. Uh, but a great swathe of the central part of New South Wales has had a wonderful autumn break. Uh, and so when we have low stock numbers and this excellent autumn break, when most of our animals now are females and they're breeders and they've been bred uh, and uh, are, reprodu are reproducing coming to lambing we've got abundant feed and we've got animals that really we don't want to get too fat so let's just think about what that actually means for our uh, for our operations and so this is what i'm was this is what i'm tasked with trying to address today so the, the presentation's broken into two parts manage what you've got and there are three elements in there that I'll touch on, which is you know, managing the ewes. Let's look at the feed base a little bit and let's think about the diseases that might come around about from what the feed base might present us as a risk. And then look ahead in terms of how you want to think about selecting your animals uh, for reproduction. What are the tricks and tools that you could use in your management and things that you can use uh, to increase the number of lambs born and really I'll start that part of the presentation by framing the context. Are you a wool grower? Are you a lamb producer? And then I'll try to wrap it up and I'll try to do this in about 40 minutes. Managing what you've got has those three components and I'll break that into sub-components looking at these, these parts here. Starting off with pregnancy scanning, managing scanned use, and then getting onto some body condition scoring. So let's manage what, what we've got. For me to manage pregnant sheep, the use of pregnancy scanning is absolutely central into all of my decision making as a manager of flocks, 
Uh, I help manage the research station flock here, which is commercial animals, but some of them are also uh, animals in our research trials. And I couldn't do it without pregnancy scanning information. So the first thing I want to just remind and reiterate for the industry is, when is the best time to pregnancy scan our animals? So if you see my mouse on the screen there, so the number of weeks since the rams were introduced is this column here. We normally talk about how many days since the rams were introduced, but you know, if your maths isn't that great, dividing something by seven and looking at, looking at a calendar, you can calculate pretty quickly how many weeks it's been since you joined the rams rather than converting it to number of days. So the number of weeks is pretty useful. So this is what this first column and the second column talk about. And I have the number of days in the brackets. If you want to wet and dry your animals to identify whether they're just pregnant or not pregnant, you've got a, a big window. You don't want that window creeping beyond 17 weeks after the rams went in because that's a gestational age of around 120 days. And some of those ewes, particularly early twinners, will start moving into a dangerous sort of an energy, uh, an energy critical period of that pregnancy. And so you don't want to have those animals curfewed and held off feed at that time. If you want to scan for twins to get the most accurate information, you need to be scanning them between 10 and 14 weeks after the rams went in. If your mating is a longer than a five to six week mating, seven, eight, nine weeks, then you can scan for twins uh, about 40 days or six weeks after the rams came out. And then that's just about it. That's your window. So this is a pretty tight window to get an accurate result in your pregnancy scanning. And if you want to use that information to manage the body condition score and the nutritional status of your animals, you haven't got long until they start to lamb. So there's a narrow period when you can identify their status and make a decision on that basis. If you want to scan for triplets, you've got to go even a little earlier again. So my rule of thumb is call the pregnancy scanner the day the rams come out. Book him in ahead of time. You've got about six weeks up your sleeve. This graph, oh, I can't, this graph is going to be absolutely horrible now when I'm not showing my whole screen. Um, so what I have here in this slide is the event, which is just in the top here. Sorry about this, this is going to be pretty tough. Kate, are you online? I might see if I can fix this to the full screen. Yeah, I'm here. What are my options here to uh, I, go uh, to full screen? Um, I think, you, so this is the screen that comes up because you have two monitors. This yep. is the screen that comes up as the notes. So can, have you got a, Have you got your other monitor? Does it have its, the presentation sitting there on another monitor? Yes, it does. Yeah, it, it is a matter of dragging that to that same screen. Oh, no, that's going to be a bit tough because that's what I've done. Okay. okay, I'll just plug, I'll just plug along. It's okay. It's only really going okay. to affect the slide. Apologies to the audience. Okay, so what I have here is in in my slide here. So I've got the date of rams in and the date of rams out as being the events for the joining period. I recommend a five week joining period, uh, and because in my experience, certainly in in this part of the world. Very few ewes are not pregnant after that period of time, and I don't want to carry them in our operation anyway. Uh, if you live in a more extensive environment, you will be joining for a longer period of time because nutrition and uh, hot weather can be uh, playing a really large uh, impact on the pregnancy rates. So you tend to join for a longer period of time. That's okay. Uh, I wouldn't want to have it run more than three cycles. <clears throat> the cycle's about 17 days. Embryo implantation and the recognition, the maternal recognition of pregnancy occurs around 12 days after conception. So by around about the seventh week, uh, so two weeks after the rams have come out, the last of those embryos have successfully implanted in the ewe and she's now a pregnant animal. If we wanted to manage the condition of those animals, recognising we've got a feed abundance or a feed deficit in front of us, we technically could start applying nutritional controls from around about eight weeks after the rams went in. But because you don't know whether you want some animals fat and some, amount, some animals lean or leaner or fatter, and you don't know how many animals are pregnant in the first instance, how can you make a decision which ones you want to optimise the management for to maximise their pregnancy outcomes? If they're all lean, um, 
you know, you're, you're finishing joining with lean animals and that's going to be a risk for the pregnancy success in any case. So during pregnancy, during the joining, you want to be having those animals on a rising plane of nutrition, then you want to maintain them until you can make a better decision. You can't really control the nutrition uh, and restrict animals if they're already getting too fat at around about the later stages of this pregnancy. So the udder starts to develop around day 125, which is around 17 or 18 weeks after the ram went in. <clears throat> and at that stage, we start to get udder development, with, which is lactogenesis, which starts to draw a lot of energy and calcium from the animal. And in this final trimester, the third trimester of pregnancy, the about 90% of the development of the fetuses is also occurring. So there's a very large amount of energy demand on the ewe from around about 18 weeks. So at this time, you can no longer apply any strict nutritional restrictions. So maybe you could do it from about eight weeks, but in the absence of all the information, you're, not, you're setting targets that you don't really know are accurate. If you apply pregnancy scanning, you can identify animals according to their need, but you then have a fairly narrow window, three weeks of pretty comfortable time to pull back the condition of these animals if they're over fat, particularly singles and very fat twins is your narrow window. Then you have to ease those restrictions and allow them to start gaining condition again as they come into lambing. So here is our window. So pregnancy scanning allows us to identify when these, which animals need the most feed. It gives us a chance to plan our feed budgets by saying, well, lambing is happening at this time, and I have this many twins and this many singles, and my feed in the, in the lambing paddocks has this much feed in it, and I can start to pull together some decisions around those budgeting processes. We can predict how many lambs we will mark. We can manage our risk. We can start to cull use if we have excess animals or rejoin them. Uh, and we can also review our performance. So if you're setting reproduction goals, pregnancy scanning is central to the achievement of those goals. Body condition scoring is the other really important tool to help us right now with how we're gonna manage our animals. It's a subjective assessment. It is the handling of the animal over the short loin, which is between the long ribs and the hips. It's a hand-based assessment. It's not an assessment that you do with your eye. As soon as the sheep grows wool, you can't see the short loin very accurately anymore. And the two critical times for me to apply pre uh, body condition scoring is about six weeks before mating. That gives you enough time to react if your ewes are too lean and at the time of pregnancy scanning. So then you can say, these ewes are twins and they're lean. And these ewes are twins and they're fat. I can create two groups if I want to do that. Likewise for our singles, you can identify the fat singles or just run them all as singles and say, I'll just hold you along a little slower. You can move in the rotation behind the twin bearing ewes. They'll get the pick. You'll clean up the mobs and we'll run our system that way and monitor body condition score. So body condition score is really the, the palpation of the amount of fat and muscle tissue around the vertebrae of the short ribs. So the dorsal and the and the, uh, the dorsal and the lateral vertebrae are the points that we feel for, as well as the amount of muscle tissue in this region. As an animal starts to get fatter and fatter, the eye muscle fills out. As they become very fat, they become very difficult to discriminate between fours and fives. And it's a process of putting your hand on the back of the animal, and there's no way around that. So if we target a population of about 50 animals, to, or a sample of 50 animals in your population, they might be a useful reference for you to get a sense for how the animals are doing. The reason the industry recommends body condition scoring is because lamb survival and ewe survival will improve as the body condition score of these ewes increases by the time of lambing. And this is particularly important for twin bearing ewes. This graph would suggest if you can lift your body condition score from two and a half up to three, you might improve your survival of twin lambs by 10 more percent, which is another 20 lambs in every 100 twin ewe mob. The targets for single bearing ewes is a lot flatter. If you have your ewes lambing at around two and a half score to three score, there's no particular improvement in lamb survival. So already we can say single ewes, we want to pull them back to about two and a half score, and my twin ewes, I want to make sure they're better than three score.
Now let's talk about the feed base. Uh, everywhere I've been around New South Wales, I'm seeing uh, tired pastures. Everybody's talking about tired pastures in the Cowra district, certainly. There's been a lot of loss of Phalaris based pastures, some fairly new stands and some fairly old stands. They just didn't hang in there long enough. And so we've got tired pastures dominated by uh, broadleaf weeds. And, uh, and it's not a wonderful situation in, some, in many locations. But then we have the forage crops. We've got grazing cereals and we've got grazing canola and we've got and forage brassicas. And these are changing the game, certainly in these sorts of regions. The implications of those forage crops are around mineral nutrition. And then when we think about our feed base coming into lambing, how much food is enough is the question I'll, I'll, I'll answer in a couple of slides. So looking at the forage crops, it's a really widely adopted technology in Southern Australia. And, and the reason for that is because it's so easily substituting. So you change the seed and you change the time of sowing and you can get into a forage production system. If you don't get your autumn break, you just go with your straight cereal production. It, it's, a, it's a very easy uh, technology to bring into your business. And because it's easy and because of all these other benefits, uh, it's been widely adopted. So these forage cropping systems, these dual purpose crops and forage plants, provide us with an enormous amount of dry matter production in a very short period of time. That's high quality energy, high quality protein. The energy can be a bit variable. That supports high stocking rate and high weight gains. And in particular during winter, when on normal pastures, you don't necessarily get the same kind of gains, or even in further south of Cowra, you start to get weight loss during winter on pastures, but on the grazing cereal crops, you get weight gains. A little caveat just to place on top of the value of these dual purpose crops is to limit the area sown to no more than 30% because while you're waiting for those crops to germinate and if you lock them up for harvest um, once they reach their growth stage uh, 3.2 I think it is, uh, so early booting, you've got to lock up that paddock uh, or paddocks and that means the pastures have to carry the rest of the load the rest of the time. So when you have too much forage crop in your system, you start to smash your pastures. Forage crops. To get the most out of these cereal crops in particular, so wheat, triticale, barley, oats, to improve the growth rates and in particular growth rates of the animals on wheat and triticale, you provide lime, cause mag and salt, and you can get uh, an improvement in growth rate on average 20% and up to 60% extra weight gain. That's by providing a, a, a mix of lime cause mag and soil at a ratio of either one to one to one or two to two to one. So if you were bucketing these minerals into a mixer, you would put two buckets of lime, two buckets of cause mag and one bucket of salt, and that will give you the right ratios of those minerals. And you make sure that you're offering at least 30 grams per head per day, and this is your expected outcome. So we have a wonderful dry matter production and with just the smallest amount of mineral supplements. So in the photograph here, I've got 11 grams of salt, which we were feeding to use in the study we just finished this week, where we were offering use up to 13 kilograms of wet perennial, uh, perennial, uh, perennial wheat. That tiny piece of salt there was changing the game for some of these animals. So a small amount can do an enormous amount. The forage brassicas and the uh, grazing canolas are providing an enormous amount of dry matter production. Each of them offer different things. The forage brassicas tend to come with a little more risk around issues like photosensitivity. On grazing cereals as well as these brassicas and canolas, you have to always watch out for nitrate poisoning. So if you've applied urea, you need to make sure many weeks have passed before you put the animals on. I would put them on in the evening when nitrates tend to be lowest in those forages so the animals will have a bit of time to eat it and start to adjust their bodies to nitrate. Cattle uh, tend to have a problem with bloat on, uh, on some of these brassicas. So those are, the, those are the, the pitfalls around these minerals. But we also have uh, issues with milk fever and grass tetany. So the mineral nutrition components around these cereals and brassicas, and I apologise, I've got 40% of the audience that don't do this work. Uh, this section's coming to an end, uh, where we have 
cereals being provided, and that's not canolas and not brassicas, the mineral content, which has excessive potassium and, and is deficient in sodium, leads to a lower absorption of calcium and magnesium. Now that happens because there's uh, in the fourth cell layer of the epithelium in the rumen, which is very specific, there's a little pump in there, the KNA pump, and it turns over based on the amount of potassium and sodium in the rumen and in the blood. So when this pump turns over, it's pulling in sodium from the rumen and with it comes magnesium and calcium. But when we have a diet that's excessive in potassium and deficient in sodium, that pump doesn't turn over because it's got no sodium to pull into it. It doesn't want to get rid of any sodium out of the body. That leads to a, a reduced absorption of magnesium and calcium, and that can have serious metabolic consequences for the animals. Over time and with stresses, let's say you are shearing or crutching the animals, or you've put the dogs in behind them pretty hard, you've got to run them a fair distance, and they've been on these cereal crops, and they've met this situation where they've got this excessive potassium and low sodium, which is a characteristic particularly of wheat and triticale. Apply the pressure with these animals on a low calcium and magnesium status, and all of a sudden you can start to see animals dropping. You might have a cold weather event associated with that that might on the first day reduce their feed intake, and, the, and you can start and you go out the next day and you've got down sheep. And those, use, those sheep are usually down with milk fever, that's hypocalcemia, it's low blood calcium levels. Theoretically, you can get grass tetany, which tends not to be so common in sheep, but a bit more in cattle. But you can also, after a long period of time on these forages, get osteoporosis and rickets in those sheep. The solution is really simple. You provide calcium, a source of calcium, magnesium and lime, which is typically, uh, sorry, not lime, sodium, which is typically lime, cosmetic and salt. And for most of those animals that eat those minerals, everything should be fine. When we talk about thinking about your tired pastures and resting lambing paddocks, these two numbers here are, are really particularly important. Single bearing ewes don't need much more than about a thousand kilograms of green feed, which for me in the Cowra district is going to be around about two inches of feed in a reasonably dense pasture base. If your pasture is sparser, then that needs to be around about three centimetres to five centimetres of feed. A twin bearing ewe is going to need at least 1500 kilograms. There's no particular benefit by having twins on a greater amount of feed than that, and that's a green uh, kilogram dry matter per hectare but there are real penalties when it starts to be below 1500 kilos. So we're talking there in a denser pasture around about three to five centimetres and a more sparse pasture, maybe around seven centimetres. If you can do a feed budget, which is really to look at how much feed have you got in that lambing paddock at the moment? How many days do I have until lambing? I can calculate roughly in rough terms, you can calculate rough terms, how much feed will be in the paddock between now and then. So let's assume our pastures will grow at 10 kilograms per hectare per day and we have 50 days to lambing. That's going to be 500 kilograms of dry matter in those paddocks. So if I'm standing in that paddock and the feed is only a centimetre or so tall, then I may not get to 1500 kilos. And so that paddock will become a single bearing ewe paddock. If my pasture growth rates are going to be 20 kilograms a day and I've got 50 days to lambing, that will be one more tonne grown in the paddock. So if I have two centimetres of feed, then I might make it. There's a simple feed budget, which you can calculate as you're walking around the paddocks. One of the ProGraze, the ProGraze package, and that is an excellent training package that helps uh, people make those sorts of decisions on allocating feed and making those sorts of budget decisions and figuring out how to do those budgets and knowing your pasture growth rate. So I've got a couple of examples. We were in a, a paddock of Lucerne a couple of weeks ago, finishing a, a triplet U study, and we were estimating the pasture quantities. And so we took some photographs, which is really difficult to do. It's actually quite hard to calculate or uh, to, to really capture a, a great photograph of feed in a paddock. Uh, Lucerne was reasonably, uh, reasonably dense, not extremely dense. So you can see the spacing there between the rows. And that was just a little bit above your ankles. And it's about 1,350 kilograms dry matter per hectare. The next slide is about 1,800 kilos, and it's between your ankles and halfway up your shin in that same sort of spacing. 
might be a nine to 10 inch row spacing. So you get a sense straight away, we've taken some cuts, we know how much feeds in that paddock and we can predict the requirements and the needs and even the stocking rate those paddocks can carry. Metabolic disease is the case of this. There's a couple of diseases I want to talk about. Uh, Pregtox in particular, which is twin lamb disease, uh, hypercalcemia, which is low blood calcium, and I'll touch a little bit on um, grass tetany, which is hypermagnesemia. Pregtox. So this is the situation I think we're facing a lot around New South Wales at the moment. We've got low stock numbers. Most of the animals are breeders. Most of those are pregnant, and we have abundant feed. And this means we'll have animals that will be starting to get fat. And the problem with fat animals, and this is condition score four and greater in those years, so you can't really feel those bones very well and you've got a very full eye muscle. Fat ewes eat less as pregnancy advances. And what that means is when, they, when they're not eating enough to meet their energy requirement from their diet, they'll top up their energy, energy reserves by metabolizing their own body fat. That fat's converted through the liver into energy, but one of the byproducts of that energy conversion is a little chemical that's classed as a ketone. Ketones build up in the brain, and when they build up in the brain faster than the brain can get rid of them, you start to get negative feedback signals that says, I don't need to eat as much. And so we have a, an unfortunate situation where these ewes are using fat for, to create energy, and they have signals that say, I don't need to eat as much feed, and that means they have to rely on more fat uh, to be metabolized through their energy. And eventually they enter this downward spiral and that's called ketosis or twin lamb disease. So the window of period that we have in front of us now to keep these twin bearing ewes in particular from getting too fat is between day 170 and day uh, 120. Anything after 120, you start to push the risk for low feed intake leading to uh, hypercalcemia in my view. Um, and so that becomes a problem, you start to do some harm. In a fat you, we've also got, uh, particularly this is a disease of twins, and so we have twins that are going to be larger. So they're not, these, these ewes are not just eating less because they're fat, but they're also unable to eat as much because the twins are also larger and they have more fat in their abdominal cavity. So there's a smaller rumen and signals that say I don't need to eat fat. And so there's a scenario there for the fat you that is a really high risk animal for, pre, uh, for pregnancy toxemia. Lean ewes are a little bit on the, on the other side. They don't have as much fat reserves, but they are lean because they're on low pasture conditions. And with low feed intake and a high demand for energy, particularly from day 125 onwards to lambing, for the twin bearing ewe, if they don't have enough energy in their diet, they will use their fat from their body reserves. And that can also lead to pregnancy toxemia. And we've got grasses that are dominant in the feed base without enough cat, without enough clover. All these animals are on a grazing cereal crop. We have a risk for hypocalcemia. Now, now, calcium in the blood is managed by hormones. It's governed by hormones. There's a number of hormones that will cascade when blood calcium levels drop. And those hormones say things like, let's open up and improve the absorption of calcium from our, uh, from our digestive tract. And if we can't get enough calcium from there, we will then turn to the bones and say, right, open up the calcium stores and let them flow because we need blood calcium. And this system works pretty well. But there are theories around in the cereal crop mineral balance where there's not quite enough sulfur and not quite enough chloride in the diet and too much potassium and, and, and uh, problems with the sodium that lead to uh, an impairment of the production of vitamin D3. Now vitamin D3 comes into the body uh, from grasses, it's converted into vitamin D2, and as it moves around the bloodstream and goes past the skin, there'll be an interaction with ultraviolet light, and that helps to stimulate vitamin D3 production, which is then creates those hormones that help to manage extra absorption of calcium from the gut or resorption of calcium from the bones. Latitude actually plays a role in how much exposure to ultraviolet light these animals have. And anybody north of 34 degrees south, which is almost at Cowra, and Bimby's just a little bit south of Cowra, so anywhere basically north of Cowra will have plenty of ultraviolet light. So generally, vitamin D3 
limits don't apply to the north and much more of an issue to the south. But if our cereal crops are impairing the production of vitamin D3, then we have another situation. So it's a possibility that the cereal crops, through their impairment of vitamin D3, can have an impact on how blood calcium is being managed. But we also know that with excess potassium and inadequate sodium, we get an impairment in the absorption of calcium, which puts all the pressure on the bones. And so we have diseases like hypercalcemia popping up occasionally on these cereal crops. And it's probably multifactorial, but there's a very real risk. Anything influencing reductions in feed intake is likely to lower the amount of calcium moving through the digestive tract and putting pressure on the bones. So we need to make sure that these hormones are working really well. Grass technique. It's fairly uncommon in sheep, it's a bit more common, much more common in cattle, but not uncommon, uh, and is related to inadequate blood magnesium. These grazing cereal crops impair blood magnesium pretty directly, and that's because magnesium doesn't have a hormone system that helps to maintain its levels in the blood. So when dietary intake declines, or when we have an impairment of the absorption of magnesium, grass technique becomes a very real risk. And we see in all the research that we've done on grazing cereals that this is there are always animals around about the clinical and subclinical level for hypermagnesemia, so grass tetany, but we never get expression of the disease. The solution for both milk fever and grass tetany is to at least provide salt and most likely salt with calcium and salt with magnesium. So lime calls make salt is a pretty robust mineral mix. And I would provide those animals if they're lambing or if they're lactating on cereal crops or if you have them on the cereal crops before lambing. So if you're resting your lambing pastures and the animals are on the cereal crops, then absolutely make sure these minerals are with those animals. And when you take them off those cereals, definitely take those minerals with those animals, have them follow them for a while and monitor their intake and budget for 30 grams per head per day. So in summary, we've got the opportunity to pregnancy scan these animals, identify the high risk animals at the time of scanning, and we have a narrow window when we can minimise uh, the amount of fat on those animals, after which we have to be very careful and mindful for uh, the risks of these sorts of diseases to re-emerge. So there's about a three week window where we can comfortably take weight off those animals after pregnancy scanning, and after that time expires, we have to be putting them back onto quality pastures and making sure they're going okay. Now, feed restriction doesn't mean no feed at all. Uh, that's not gonna work. It's about pulling them down a little bit and slowly. You've got about a three week period there that's pretty safe and pretty comfortable, after which you start running risks. Right, so this is the other half of the presentation. What are we gonna do at the end of this year and what are we gonna do in the future? So firstly, you can define yourself as a wool grower, as a lamb producer, or a little bit of both. Now, I don't mind how you describe yourself. That's I'm a biologist. I'm interested in improving production of animals in a sustainable and welfare-oriented manner. So it's up to you to define your own target weaning rate, and your target will depend on where you are located. If you're in merinos, because they offer such a high fleece value, that does permit lower reproduction rates because your production, your productivity on a dollars per hectare basis is still there. If you have not, if you have shedding sheep or animals with low fleece value, you absolutely drive your business with reproduction rates. If you want to lift your reproduction rates, you need to be mindful that you've got to manage your stocking rate because you can't just get something for nothing. These animals will be eating more feed when they're pregnant and more lambs will be weaned and they'll be eating more feed. So you need to be doing your budgets and managing your stocking rate. But as a rule, lifting reproduction, that's the number of lambs weaned by 1%, increases your gross margin by 1%. If you want to set some targets, you need to measure. So absolutely keep long-term records. You know, everybody really should need to know how many lambs they weaned and how many ewes they joined last year and the year before that and before that. Because if something's happening in your, inside your business, such as a brucellosis outbreak, you will see weaning rates or pregnant ewe rates declining slowly and then suddenly. 
if you've got these long-term records, you can judge and review. So use your pregnancy scanning sensibly. Prepare the ewes by, by keeping them kneel by mouth, no water, no feed overnight. That will improve the accuracy of the pregnancy scanning. Judge your pre-mating body condition score so you can lift your pregnancy scanning rates and then set some goals. Goals that I would suggest for maidens are 90% pregnant, 95% pregnant in the adults. Average scanning, so, average scanning rate for a fairly large data set uh, is around 123%. And lamb survival targets for you would be 90% for singles and 80% twins. So if you have 100 uh, twin bearing ewes in a paddock, you want to mark 160 lambs. And out of the singles, that's 90 lambs. If you calculate your litter size and you know how many singles and twins you have, you multiply those two numbers together, that would be your target number of lambs marked. I challenge you to do that and I challenge you to beat it. And every year you can review your results if you're keeping these long-term records. If you want to increase the number of lambs born, you've got a short-term and a long-term way of doing this. Uh, and particularly the long-term focus is on the number of lambs weaned. In the short term, you've got three approaches, managing body condition score, nutritional supplementation, and hormone manipulation. The relationship between body condition score, which you see at the bottom of the screen here in this bottom of the graph here, as body condition score increases from two and a half up to four, the ovulation rate, which is on the y-axis, this vertical axis here, starts to increase. Now that's the number of eggs that are shed from the ovaries, ovulation rate. And as that number increases, the likelihood of being pregnant and having one lamb or having two lambs increases. So the relationship holds that in a March mated flock, as we increase body condition score, we start to get a pretty good increase in ovulation rate. But the same relationship doesn't hold for October to December mated flocks. It's a much flatter relationship. The R squared there is closer to zero, 0 0.09, compared to the autumn flocks, which is nearly point, you know, it's 0.37. So when you mate and how you manage condition score is actually particularly important. So you need to be thinking about that coming into joining. What is your target? How responsive is your flock? I don't think a lot of people really know the answer to that question. And it may drive how you manage how much grain or how much supplementation in other forms you provide your animals. What is your target? It's an important introspective question we need to ask ourselves. As, again, as we increase the condition score of ewes at joining, the number of lambs born is increasing per 100 ewes. It's a fairly linear relationship. And of course, the corollary of that is as we're increasing our number of lambs born, it means we're increasing our twin ewes and the number of single ewes is declining. And what also happens is we get a reduction in the number of dry ewes. And so lifting condition score gives us more pregnant ewes that are carrying twins. Hormones, this is really interesting stuff. Overstim and regular, the two primary hormones on the market. Overstim used to be called fecundin, and it's a vaccine that blocks the dominant ovarian follicle that says, I only need to produce one egg. And it blocks that signal the ovaries produce more eggs. This can increase triplets and particularly so in automated flocks. So be mindful. It costs around about, I would budget around about these days, $2 for a dose of Overstim. If you're going to use Overstim, it's two injections in the first year and one injection every year thereafter. Regulin is a hormone uh, called melatonin and it mimics the shortening of day length. So the bodies naturally produce melatonin as the days shorten, so from January onwards, the concentration of melatonin increases in the body naturally. So if we expose our animals to melatonin regulin in October and in, no and in November, uh, we'll trick them into thinking that it's February and March, and that will increase ovulation rate. Both products are claimed to improve the number of lambs born by about 20%, but you need to use them wisely and you need to target certain ewes. So if I was to summarise how you can use things like Lucin and Lupins and Fecum Genetics in against Regulin and Overstim, I would have this table. I think what you should do is take a screenshot of this image because there's a fair amount of detailed information in there. 
If you're going to use overstim, I would be using it in spring and early summer mated flocks, and I would not use it in autumn mated flocks. I would target lean ewes in late summer, uh, as if, if you're making those injections later in summer. And that's because you will get more twins and it's a cheap way to get twins out of lean ewes. But of course, because they're lean, they'll still be lean at scanning. And so your responsibility is to pregnancy scan that ewe and improve her body condition score for lambing. Otherwise, that will be a wasted exercise. Regulin's much the same. All ewes and rams can be treated. Um, and in spring and early summer matings, there will be limited value. Let's leave that injection later and later into autumn. So I would, I would control my regular use probably by the end of uh, December. Some producers are injecting 40% of their use only with regular and getting good responses. For cum genetics is really interesting. These are animals that have genes to increase the number of ovulations and they respond very well to body condition scores. So the advantage in those animals is that you can run them a little leaner and get your twins still. So that means you don't have to feed them anything uh, until you've got them to pregnancy scanning and then you have to manage their condition score very carefully because an animal that's lean at the time of lambing isn't going to have a good lambing outcome. You can stimulate these sorts of uh, ovulatory responses by providing animals with a boost in protein or energy and lupins is a very safe feed to apply in short bursts uh, because when compared to cereal grains. So if you're feeding ewes 400 grams of lupins, not 250 grams of lupins per day for a fortnight before joining and a fortnight into joining, you'll get an excellent increase in the number of twinning ewes and a reduction in the number of dry ewes. So this is a really good trick for lean ewes uh, through the autumn mating when you tend to have dry pastures uh, in most, most parts of Southern Australia. Lucin can work any time, one week before joining, and up to 10 days into joining and then remove the use off will give you a real boost, but you need to make sure that you're not doing this on aphid infect infested pastures or on wilting loosen because they increase phytoestrogen content. If we want to think about the long term, we've got selection for rearing ability, which is really looking at the wetting and drying of udders after lambing. You've got sire selection. You want to make sure those sires are born and reared as twins, that's what BTRT means, bought birth type and rear type. And you've got a number of ASBVs that you can choose to select, and there's also fecund breeds. Selection for rearing ability, wetting and drying others. If there was only one tool that I was allowed to use to improve reproduction rates, this would be it. Wetting and drying others. It gives you the chance to look at those teats and the others and cull out the ones that are starting to fail and cull those ewes that repeat repeatedly or for the first time in their life were pregnant and failed to rear lambs. The rules are fairly simple. In self-replacing flocks that grow wool, you can take more time. Uh, so if you have low, moderate to low rearing rates, which I would say is 100% or less, then you can identify the ewe when she's dry at any time, scanning or marking. Identify her, put a tag in her ear, and then give her another chance. If they're ever dry again in their life, you then cull those animals. That will reduce the number of animals you have to sell in the first instance, which allows you more selection pressure for other traits like wool quality traits. And because you're culling fewer animals, but you're doing so more accurately for their reproduction status, your genetic gain for reproduction will be faster. If you're in a wool self-replacing flock with already very good uh, reproduction rates, so that shouldn't say moderate to low rearing rates, that should say uh, good quality, re high re rearing rates, then you need to make room. You've got lots of surplus stock, so you cull for the first time dry. And if you're in a meat production business, you cull for the first time dry every time, or you remake immediately. Sire so selection is also pretty important. If you're buying a ram, and I don't care whether it's black or white or pink or blue or upside down, whatever tickles your fancy is your particular breeding objective. If you want to improve reproduction, only buy the rams that are born and reared as twins. Wetting and drying udders, you should also know, uh, will increase the twinning rates. And that's because a ewe that has twins but only rears one is still wet. She still has a full udder at marking or weaning. 
if she had a single lamb and lost that lamb, she would be dry. So we tend to cull dry ewes and keep twinning ewes. And when over time, as they breed replacements into your self-replacing breeding program, you start to increase the number of ewes with twins in their background, and that increases twinning rates. It's also the best time, of course, as I said, to judge the udder. And there's quite a lot of variation. When you start doing this, you find a lot of uh, low quality teeds and poor udders. And after a couple of years, that tightens up really quickly. So depending on your breeding objectives, you're always looking for a sire that's going to give you the best. Uh, if you want to emphasize uh, your reproduction, only buy rams born and reared as twins. And if you want to learn a bit more about how to assess udders, just go to Google and type in udder assessment DPI and you'll pull up the prime facts on udder assessment and the YouTube videos that we put together a few years ago. There's also ASBVs. The reproduction ASBVs are number of lambs weaned, birth weight, uh, and yearling eye muscle depth and yearling fat uh, also have some positive correlations with reproduction rates. Uh, and of course, there's always the fecund breeds. Unfortunately, not enough studs record their reproduction data, particularly birth weight, uh, but there are a lot of breeders selected for muscle and fat. For any stud and any commercial operation, most of the gains you'll make in reproduction come from direct selection. So traits like birth weight, breeding values for birth weight, eye muscle depth and fat will help, but you will be making much faster gains by selecting those animals for direct reproduction, pregnant and rearing. Number of lambs weaned ASPV is still under review and hopefully in the future we'll pick up a few more traits around that, such as fertility, number of lambs born or litter size and survival. This is, I think, the best graph to explain why reproduction can be improved through uh, rearing ability and the selection of ewes uh, on the basis of their udders. There's four colours in the graph. The first colour is the ewe fertility. So when you start culling out ewes in the first couple of years, uh, you end up with a population of animals that, can, that are fairly robust in their ability to get pregnant and very limited gains occur in fertility after about five years of selection from that trait alone. If we're selecting ewes for their ability to get pregnant and rear lambs, this is the pink section in here. This is lifetime selection. So allowing an animal to fail once, reproduce again, and the next time it's failed, it's culled. This is the kind of gain that you will make, and it is the bulk of the gain that you'll make in the first six or seven years, but then it tends to plateau out. At that time, we're starting to rely more heavily on ram genetics, and eventually, the eugenetics comes in. So the influence of rams is pretty strong and much stronger because they conceive so many uh, lambs, whereas a ewe will only rear you know, one or two at a time. So their contribution is slower. But it's through current generation gain and removing the ewes that can't rear lambs out of our flock is where most of our gains will come from. But put the package together, that is to scan, cull the dries, wet and dry the ewes at marking, Cull the repeat fails, select your rams for these reproductive traits, and eventually we'll make this level of gain. The summary this is my second last slide. I got there and I nearly did it in 15 minutes. I'm very happy. What do you do now? So you've got to assess your lambing pastures. Doesn't matter when you're lambing, go and have a look at them and see how much they've got. Will they have enough for the singles and the twins? If you've got animals on cereal crops, you absolutely mandatory have to provide lime, cause mag and salt or products that offer salt, uh, calcium and magnesium. On the brassicas, just keep your eye on those animals. If they give you give them anything, maybe it's a bit of hay to take pressure off the bark on the trees. Act now to assess the body condition score of your ewes. I would always put your hand on the, on the loin of those animals when they're in the yards. Always assess condition score of the animals. It's such an informative, uh, simple and cheap tool. Check your joining dates to see how long you've got to manage condition if you've got fat animals now. Strongly advocate always the pregnancy scanning of ewes. It doesn't matter the situation, there's always value to take from that information. Always value in that information. I would always recommend uh, tagging a ewe that's dry with a particular ear tag that makes sense. So uh, a very clever farmer locally puts the year of birth tag, the current year of birth tag in the in the year of that animal if she's dry. So then he'll know not just that she was dry, but also when she was dry. 
Always purchase the best rams available. Don't be cheap on buying rams. There's no, no value in that. Uh, and of course, the breeding objective has to align with yours. And if you want to improve reproduction, I've listed a few key traits, but critically, the stud needs to be selected for improved reproduction and you will buy only born and reared twins from that from that stud and you will make considerable gains over the 10 year period. And the use of lupins, loosen, overstim or regulin can be tactically done and you'll get the most by, uh, by targeting your leaner animals and that means using condition score. Okay, that is my presentation. That's my last slide. That is in the lambing drift at Trangy and was taken in 2008, which is a long time ago now. Uh, and I don't have that hat or that backpack anymore. <laughs> Kate, it's over you. I'm very happy to take some questions. No worries. Thank you for that, Gordon. That was excellent. I'm curious, what are you using the binoculars for? What are you looking we're at? To, we're trying to find the used mum. Ah, uh, the lamb, the lamb. Yeah. Uh, um, so we do have a few questions. I'm mindful of time. So for you, Gordon, um, from Liz, she's asked, can you use dolomite and salt rather than Cosmag lime and salt? Yes, you can. I haven't heard of any particular problems with that. Be mindful that dolomite is uh, less palatable. So it's a little bit more bitter. Um, so maybe increase the salt amount. Uh, and if they're still not eating it, uh, add a bit of sugar. But if your animals are already using that product, go for your life. Um, Liz has also asked, do you have any suggestions as to get weight off dropper used when there is abundance of feed? Yeah, okay. So as I've, just, as I've teased out in the, in the information there, it depends on the stage of pregnancy uh, and whether they're bearing singles or twins. You can push twin bearing you a little harder than uh, than you can push a twin. Sorry, you can push a single much harder than you can push a twin. Um, but you've got up to about day 120 uh, from the day of rams in to just knock a little bit of fat off those animals. If the condition score you see of those animals at the moment is the same as you've seen in the past, uh, then have some confidence that uh, they'll handle those conditions. Dorpers will store fat on the outside of their body much more than a merino will, so they'll always look like they're in better condition. And uh, if you start to feel like you're having problems, then that's when you intervene. So if you've got fat animals and you're worried about their intake, you can start to introduce grain to them, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's the only way you'll get dense energy into a restricted rumen and a low, a low diet, uh, and then add salt and see how that stimulates their behaviour. Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds good. Um, we've had one coming from Will Chaffee, and he's asked, "What is Gordon's? Uh, what is your latest findings on best practice of lambing paddock size, lambing density, and numbers?" Yeah, g'day, Will. Great question. So the lambing density project was an AWI and MLA funded project. It wrapped up a couple of years ago, uh, and we find three things from that critically. Uh, firstly. Uh, the area of the paddock is a little bit um, vague. So it's how many animals you put in that paddock is actually the critical indicator. And when we tested stocking rate, so that's paddock and numbers together, uh, we didn't find any particular effect in this study. Now we were testing a difference of about two ewes per hectare as a comparison. And that was you know, by negotiation with the producers, we sort of went to them and said, how many ewes do you normally lamb down per hectare? Can we reduce one per hectare and add another one per hectare? Because we were concerned about pushing that too hard. And I don't think we did. So there's a room there for two ewes per hectare, fairly comfortable. But what stood out of that work critically was mob size is important, but it's a little, there's a caveat on that. For most situations, if you reduce the number of ewes lambing in a mob by 100 ewes, you should expect to wean another 2% of lambs, and that's in twins. That's sorry, improve, sorry, that's you'll mark another 4% of lambs because you get an improvement in survival of 2%. When feed is limited and you have to trail feed these ewes, the size of the mob will influence that lamb survival by about 6%. So if we reduce the mob size from, let's say, 
200 down to 75, you could expect to wean another 12% uh, of lambs. But if the feed is abundant, more than two and a half tonnes or thereabouts, kilograms dry matter per hectare, there's no effect of mom size on lamb survival. So it's important in most situations at around 2%. When things are really good, it's not so important. When things are really tight, it's actually pretty important. So there's no number. There's no number that says this is the ideal mob size. Uh, and that's because there's an enormous amount of variation in the size of our paddocks and the, and the, and the abundance of feed and the size of the operations and the landscapes we're farming in. But uh, the rule is reduce the number of twin bearing units by 100 and you'll get a benefit. No worries. We've had one other, we might just, yeah, one more question, which is a good one, and it's coming from Tim. And it says, do you have any um, specific management practices for triplets? That's a really good question. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so there is a project uh, operating at the moment, an MLA-funded project on improving the survival of twin ewes and their lambs. This is the second year of that study. So uh, we're testing five different types of regimes, which is uh, maternal U condition score targets, merino U condition score targets. We're looking at supplementation with minerals, we're looking at grain and feed on offer combinations, and, uh, and we're looking at whether there's any value in separating those ewes as triplets or twins, which is what we're calling mixed versus managed. At the moment, my sense is that if you've got uh, fat triplet ewes, they will lamb better if they are leaner, but you have a difficult time getting them lean without challenging their health. So the irony there is, of course, a ewe that's fatter at joining is likely to have triplets. Uh, and so by the time of scanning, she's still going to rank in the fatter group. Um, and depending on how fat that actually is, you may have some challenges there. So the triplet is still uh, a very difficult animal to manage, and at the moment there's no particular recommendation. But within, I say, I'd say one to two years, we'll have uh, a much greater sense for what the options are around that. I haven't really answered your question, Tim, but it's a really good one, and this is actually ongoing research. Yeah, it's a really interesting space, especially in that um, with the triplets. So yeah, no, that was a good answer. Thanks, Gordon. Um, we've just I might fit one more in, and it's just a bit interesting. Um, has there been any research done on four teat ewes and their milk production? There's a little tiny bit of literature on it, uh, and and. Uh, <laughs> That's such a good question. It is a good question because um, because they generally have two teats and they can, and they're fecund type animals and they can have up to three lambs, uh, whereas a cow's going to have four teats and only spit out one calf. Uh, such is the irony of the two outcomes. Um, generally, the, the the third and fourth teats can be bl are blind generally, so they're not likely to be uh, providing milk. So if you had an animal that was milking out of four teats, um, you know, I think she'd be a pretty rare animal. So I'm not too sure at the moment whether there's enough of those sorts of animals to really breed from or even whether it's possible. My understanding of the topic is that it's not likely. No worries. Well, thank you for that, Gordon. Um, we do have Brett on the line there, but um, he hasn't he hasn't had the opportunity to say anything yet, but I will say that um, Brett Smith's always available. He's obviously works with elders, and yeah, he's always available for any opportunities to um, answer any questions from producers. So um, his details are in the registration, and if you are wanting his details, please contact me. Um, I thank Brett for listening in and being available. Thank you, Gordon, for your excellent presentation. It was fantastic, and I always find it very interesting. What what you have going on and what you're working it on and the stuff that you're getting as a result of it. So thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you to everyone who's listened in. We've just had a couple of people popping more questions in. I'll aim to get those questions off to um, Gordon and if he had some time, he might be able to answer them um, for you specifically, but we're just 
being aware we're already 10 minutes over, so we might have to pull up there. So thank you very much for everyone to, for, participate, for participating tonight, and we look forward to hearing from you in our next webinar. Thank you.